Okay, well, uh, hello all and um, thanks for joining us. Welcome to our webinar, Canada, Wines with a Cool Climate Sensibility. Um, I'm Andrew Catchpole, editor of Harper's Wine and Spirit. Um, Co-hosting with me today is um, author and critic Jamie Good. Hey, Jamie. Hello. Uh, Jamie's going to talk more on the wine side, um, not least as he spent um, some time in Canada, I'd be judging there as well. Uh, quite familiar with the with, with the wines, the winemaking and so on. Um, and then we're going to follow that up uh, and I'll sort of take over a little more and talk a little bit more about Canada and its potential in the UK market. Um, so we're also joined by a great panel today, um, some very familiar faces to most in the UK trade, certainly, um, and all of whom I believe are already importing from Canada, so have some experience of Canadian wines in, in this market. So. Um, first-hand country of uh, experience, sorry, of what the country offers. So to introduce all, um, Sarah, Sarah Knowles, the Wine Society. Hi, Sarah. Uh, David, David Gleave, MW of Liberty Wines. Hi, Andrew. Hi, David. Uh, Nick, Nick Darlington, um, co-director of Graft Wine Company. Hello. Uh, ben Franks of uh, Novel Wines. Hello. And last but very far from least, um, Janet, Janet Dorozniski, um, sorry, stumbled on that a little bit, um, Government of Canada anyway, who is our um, sponsor and uh, uh, partner in this, 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 this webinar. Um, never going to live down that, that name slip, am I? But there you Dorozinski. Go. <laughs> Hello. We just, we just say J-Do, J-Do, Andrew, it's very easy, J-Do. <laughs> Jay Doe, thank you. That's good. Excellent. Better to um, better to blunder and then get it right later on. So here we go. Um, okay. Um, so why another webinar, and most importantly, why a webinar on Canadian wines? Um, I think it's fair to say that while some have retreated to sort of safe haven, perhaps bigger brand wines, more recognisable wines during the pandemic, certainly a, a recent survey or a pair of surveys that we at Harper's ran on the uh, independent sector. Um, revealed that, that the majority were saying their customers had actually become, the majority of their customers had become more adventurous um, during the past sort of year or so, which was, was sort of building on a trend that was already occurring before, uh, possibly because people had more time on their hands to explore wine, more time to sit at home and think about it. So in a way, sort of construct their own drinking experience rather than going out into the, the on-trade. Um, and I think there's also a general trend with, with that question for people to be looking for wines with um, greater authenticity, a sense of place, but also um, that lend some sort of individuality. Um, cooler climate, fresher, perkier styles uh, are also sort of, you know, um, increasingly in vogue. I think people are pulling away globally from sort of bigger, bolder wines to sort of fresher, uh, more poised styles. Um, and I think Canada seems to fit the bill on all of these counts. Uh, and pretty much that's what we're here to explore today. So um, the panel here, I've uh, been lucky enough to pre-taste a, a selection of Canadian wines. And one of the, we're, we're gonna start the discussion um, with um, a little talk on, on the wines stylistically, where collectively they're coming from, any that stand out uh, individually, um, whether that be varieties or regions within Canada, and um, just gain a few sort of uh, pointers from the, from the panel as to what they picked up from the, um, I think really quite good, very good samples that we, uh, we tried. Um, Jamie, I don't know if, if you wanna pick up there and just give a general overview about Canada. You've, you've, you've spent a fair amount of time there now, haven't you? Obviously not in the last 12 months, but- um, Yes, I, mean, I, first, I first went to Canada in 2013 um, and I've been back more than once, um, often multiple times every year since. And I've also judged five years for the National Wine Awards of Canada, along with Janet, who is a, a one of the senior judges there. Um, and so I've kind of, I kind of um, really got into Canada, and it's it's interesting because this is a this is a big country, and you've got wine regions, I believe, three and a half thousand kilometers apart that we're looking at today. So we're we're going to the west coast, the Okanagan Valley, which is one of the the the, the two largest regions in the country, and then we're heading further east, so not fully east, um, to the Niagara region, which um, abuts the US border um, about an hour and a half's drive from Toronto. Um, and um, it's funny because these, these, these geographically and, you know, in terms of location and, you know, situation, these wine regions are very far apart, but um, 
there's certainly a similarity in the style of some of the wines, which is what, what we kind of coined the title cool climate sensibility for. And there's also some varieties that have shown particularly well. And so this selection of wine focuses on some of the, the key varieties that have done really well. Some shared between both um, of the major wine regions. And when I say we've got Niagara in Ontario, we've also got two wines from other Ontario wine regions. The two major regions in Canada, well, then they're, they're less significant regions, but the two other regions that we haven't caught up in this um, seminar are, um, are Nova Scotia, which is making waves with its crisp whites and sparkling wines, and also Quebec, which is, you know, has a very, very tough climate with very vicious winters. Um, but it's starting to make some quite interesting wines. So those two we haven't looked at. So we're going to focus on Ontario and the Okanagan Valley. And um, you'll notice that the one of two of the two of the varieties that are very highly represented here are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, they're consistently good both in the Okanagan and in Niagara. And the the feature of the the growing season I think is really worth outlining here because Although we're talking about a very northerly region, you know, in the Okanagan, we're I think 50 degrees north, and in in um, in Ontario, we're about 45. Um, what you've got is you've got these very cold winters and this slow start to the season. Then you've got a warm summer usually, um, and in, in Niagara, it can be quite humid as well. And then it, a nice tapering autumn that allows the grapes to reach ripeness. But um, it's one of the handy things is that the grapes are being harvested in autumnal conditions. And I think this is, this is enough, this really helps preserve acidity, create fresh wines. Um, so maybe the best thing would me, be for me to ask um, each of you, the panelists, what your impressions of the wines were and which highlights, you know, which things grabbed you. I mean, obviously this is a sampling of 16 wines. It's not a comprehensive trawl through everything that Canada does, but I think it gives a, a good indication of, of some of the strengths. And some of these wines are, are expensive, but some of them are really smart price points. So um, Sarah, I'll start with you. Um, what, what's your impression just tasting through this subset of wines? Um, so I think tasting through, generally speaking, the quality is quite high. I think you've already framed the idea that Chardonnay and Pinot come out quite well from both sides of the country. And I think that is showing here with some of the, uh, the Pinots, especially showing some quality from both sides. Um, I think the two Rieslings that we tasted are worth highlighting because I think they showed pretty well. I think um, I've tasted more widely with Riesling across Canada and I feel that that also is mm. perhaps one of the strengths, although um, although the wine trade love Riesling, it's always a little bit of an unfortunate strength when Riesling is the, is the key because, of course, we know commercially it's not necessarily the most um, easy to sell great variety, um, although I'm sure... Um, we're all purchasing our fair share. Um, Just to interrupt there, Sarah, it's quite, it was yeah. quite interesting. I got some samples through from Aldi the other day, and Aldi have listed a Riesling um, made by the same producer that made the first wine in this tasting, Henry of Pelham. Mm -hmm. It's a private label wine. Um, I tried it yesterday. I think it was pretty smart, and it's on the shelf at nine ninety nine. So it's very interesting that Discounter is stocking a Canadian Riesling at nine ninety nine. Yeah. But yeah, I think the thing to note, the Henry of Pelham that was in this tasting, the Canadian retail is $14.95, which in Canadian terms is as cheap as wine gets. Um, you know, yeah. the LCBO at $14.95. So I imagine that's something that would have a price point that would be quite appealing in the UK. I think it's it really interesting. attractive Riesling, yeah. Because of course, Aldi also famously stock a very good Clare Valley Riesling um, and have made some sort of splashes with that in the past. And I think that's around the same sort of just under £10 mark. So it'd be interesting to see how um, the UK consumer sees the two, because it's not, you know, it's not as though Clare Valley Riesling has the most incredibly easy time either in the UK. So both are somewhat explore and both are dry, high acid Rieslings. Um, so it should be, it will be an interesting comparison to see how that goes and how that listing um, continues. Um, but no, I thought, I thought that went well. And then I think, you know, it's, it's, um, it would be crazy not to highlight the two ice wines here. Um, given that, you know, Canada, um, if you talk Canadian wine with the majority of consumers in the UK, um, and I'm sure other panelists may have other views on this, but the majority of consumers in the UK might only know about ice wine still, um, because that is, is the, the sort of hook that um, Canada has been hung on for a long time in the UK, uh, very successfully producing high quality um, 
great sweet wines. I think those two definitely deserve a mention. Andrew, Jamie, I wonder um, if it's possible to share the list of wines that we're tasting with the, um, the group. I think we've had it come up in the chat that people are unsure which, which producers we're tasting and referring to. Yes, yeah, so it's possible to, to share if that. We, if, we, if we try and mention names, so I think we're, we're in a skillet, aren't we? And um, uh, was it is Pella Estates? I'll, um, let me just flash this up, but we will ensure that everyone attending uh, receives. Yeah, if somebody if somebody uh, who's that got access to them could copy and paste them into the chat, that might be useful. I, I'm not sure I've got a format that I can copy and paste into the chat. Right, now. I could copy and paste all my notes into the chat, but that might be too much. Um, yeah, so the the two ice wines, then the Inniskillen Vidal ice wine um, and the Pella Estates Riesling ice wine, both 2017. Yeah, this, this is a funny thing because ice wine is, is really, um, you know, when you taste these, not having any knowledge of Canadian wine, they are remarkable wines. The problem yeah. is in, when I've been in Canada um, and judging wine with Canadian journalists and, and talking with Canadian producers, they're kind of frustrated that there's this indelible association of Canada with ice wine and people find yes. it hard to look past ice wine to what the other stuff that Canada is doing. And the other Whereas, slightly, slightly cautious thing is that, that um, the ice wine is very profitable for a lot of the big companies, but none of the small companies, the boutique wineries make ice wine. It's, it's all done big companies. And so yeah. that creates us, you know, among the boutique producers, there's a little tension there. Um, so, and of course, interestingly, on the, on the UK market, I, I judged Decanter, or have judged the Canadian set of wines at Decanter for the last five years. And of course, ice wine is the category where we get the most gold. Um, so it is still standing out and it's a cross variety. So with Riesling and Vidal. Um, yeah. The question is, is it going to sell? Some of these are quite expensive. Thank you, whoever posted that. Oh, Sue posted all the list of the wines in the chat. So if you want to see those, just pop over to the chat. Yeah, um, because they're quite expensive wines. And in Canada, the joke is that they're the, um, they're the world's most re-gifted wines because you get this expensive bottle of ice wine mm -hmm. and you think, what can I do with it? You know, because they it's are very duty free, have, um, friendly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then, it, yeah, as you say, it's a strength and they are remarkable wines. And Canada can pretty much own this category of ice wine because it's getting too warm to make them in Germany and Austria. So I would just add, just for everyone's information who doesn't know, we actually make only three or four percent of our production overall is ice wine and about 5% of what we export is ice wine. It just happens to be quite high value. So it actually, it appears more prominent than it actually is. And yes, to Jamie's point that there are a lot of producers now, especially in BC, they're not even making ice wine anymore. So um, they really want to hang their hat on table wine. So can we have Janet? Sorry, David, to interrupt. Um, just, just, just quickly. Just, um, what would be the top sort of three, four, five lead uh, varieties in terms of what's grown and or what's exported at the moment? Uh, what's yeah, just exported? roughly? I'm not asking for for actual figures, but just what what are the big what are the big hitters as well? Yeah, what's exported? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. We don't really have great stats in the country. I have a stat envy every time I see countries posting that but um, in terms of production um, for reds Merlot and Cabernet Franc are the the largest sort of volume um, Riesling and Chardonnay are for whites we have a fair bit of Videl as well that is used for ice wine and for blended wine and um, I guess a lot of the the wines that we're tasting today are sort of the core varieties or emerging as the core varieties in uh, BC and Ontario. Uh, Nova Scotia and Quebec tend to have more hybrids and um, a focus on sparkling wine. It's unfortunate that because we were decanting the wines into small format bottles we couldn't feature any of the the sparkling wines that are in the market in the UK. But um, yeah, so those are sort of the, the, the largest production that we have right now. Okay, fantastic. Sorry, David, I think I, I, I jumped in just ahead of you. Um, yeah, no, I was just gonna um, make the point that, um, you know, Canada shouldn't be 
you know, worried or embarrassed by its reputation for ice wine. I think, you know, it, it was the first wine, first Canadian wine that got export recognition and helped, you know, and, and having grown up in Canada, uh, there wasn't anything, anything else there that was going to get export recognition until ice wine came along. Um, so I think, you know, it's done a great job, but it sticks. Um, but it's got to be used as a door opener for other varieties now. And I think, you know, when we, we sell, we sell a, you know, a fair amount of ice wine um, in, in, in London, especially to top restaurants. So it's, it's making, putting Canada on top wine lists. That door is open. Now it's the opportunity for other varieties um, to come in. And, you know, it, it, Canada hasn't necessarily had the scale of, of wines at this quality to, to export in the past. But what I'd say to sort of Canadian producers is, you know, you've got to turn your, I know it's, you know, you've got a great domestic market, whether you're in, in you know, Vancouver or in, in Toronto or you're selling in, in Quebec, you know, it's a great domestic market and that's good. But you should also turn your um, eyes to export markets because, you know, it's going to help you make your wines better. You know, to sell in the domestic market where you've got an audience that's going to love you know, Canadian wines, that's great. But when you get onto the international market, get into, you know, where you're competing with the best from the rest of the world, you're going to get better. You're going to have to get better. And I think that'll help you make better wines. And, you know, the changes that, you know, we've seen in Canadian wine. When I first went to Clos Jordan, sort of probably, ooh, you know, almost 12, 13 years ago, you know, the wines were, they were good. They were good, but you look at these wines today, the Chardonnays that got lined up in front of us, there's some pretty smart wines. You look at the Pinots, and they're lovely wines. They're really attractive, fresh, clean, well-made, you know, not a hint of Britannomyces. So, you know, take that to some countries in the world and, and, and show it to them, you know, because those are good wines and they will stand out. Sorry, Nick, I, got, I got distracted there. But, uh, Nick, you know. Nick, what was your impression of these wines? I'm curious, because you import, you import one Canadian winery that's maybe a little bit different, yeah. We do, which wasn't in this lineup. Um, it's, it's not in any lineups at the moment, but for arcane reasons due to Canadian winter and shipping during a Canadian winter, um, which I can see that Ben's chuckling about because he's, he's looking forward to getting his hand on some uh, when they do. Anyway, I, I thought that the wines in general, the consistency across the board was very good, but if there are some key themes, the Okanagan probably just about edged Niagara for me, for, for consistency. I think that Pinot Noir was the Trump grape. I should probably shouldn't say Trump grape. Pinot Noir is the best grape um, consistently as well. And I thought that Chardonnay was up there but I thought that it was a bit of a game of two halves for me with Chardonnay. I thought there was some Chardonnay that was absolutely excellent. And then there was some Chardonnay that was a bit clumsy. Uh, and I think that if there's an overriding theme with these Canadian wines and, and Canadian wines I've tasted in the past, which, which they is uniform, is that there is a, it's sometimes difficult to see what the winemaker is trying to achieve. They might've made a really, really good wine and are representing the climate that they're making that wine in very, very well. But there's nothing that I can instantly say that's Canada in a way that maybe I can start to say about the Pinots and in a way that I can start to say about certain things like Gamay that I've tried out of Okanagan Valley, for example. So that it's, it's lacking maybe a unifying theme, but the quality consistency, I think, was very, very good. Um, ben, what was your impression? So, I mean, as, as Nick said, uh, we were very excited for the Haywire to come back. Um, and actually, that was the first one that got me excited about Canadian wine. But the, the interesting thing about tasting these is as someone quite new to Canadian wine, but very excited by it, um, was the clarity of fruits, especially in the white wines. I thought it was uh, very impressive to see such purity given that some of these wines are, are now a couple of years old. Um, and, and even with all the extra flavours and things, and the, I imagine some of these have been through mallow and things, the, there was still a real brightness of, of fruit flavour. So I was quite pleased with that, and I can definitely find people in uh, Novel Wines' customer base who are looking for something different that would get these uh, folks really excited. 
Um, so that, that was encouraging. And then on the Pinot Noir, I was really impressed in particular on the reds. Um, again, the, the, the fruit uh, has brilliant clarity. And for me, young wines are consumer friendly. So as a retailer, there's some really exciting commercial uh, potential for this. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see how they develop and also what, what other kind of varieties we can get in being novel. We're looking for the stuff that it, that is unique. So um, yeah, yeah, interesting and exciting. So very positive. Yeah, and there's one thing that's that, that, that we haven't got quite enough of, we should have more of in this lineup is Cabernet Franc because in Niagara, it's the strongest red grape variety. Uh, and so um, there's a lot of fantastic examples. We've got the Stratus. I'd be interested to know what you thought of the Stratus because they're very high, highly regarded. They make the wines in quite a, uh, a, an opulent style. It's 14 and percent alcohol picked very late, but they always, they're always among the top tier uh, of, of Niagara and Cabernet Francs. I, I thought that it, was, it was excellent. Um, I mean, it, the key is it's, instant, it's recognizably Cabernet Franc. Whereas I think sometimes in this very weighty style, uh, and they're clearly going for that big style in many ways. You can lose what makes Cabernet Franc great, which is that leafiness. And you do get that. You do get the ripe fruit, which you will get in you know, good vintage Cabernet Franc from cooler areas in Europe as well. And I mean, I was astonished to look at the tech sheet and see that it was 15% alcohol, basically. Uh, and it, it carries it very well. I'm not necessarily going to praise any wine that achieves 15% alcohol as a good thing. But if it does, then it it should carry it. And it really, really does. I thought it was an excellent wine. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of really good Cabernet Franc in, in Ontario. And there's some good Cabernet Franc in, in BC as well. And the other thing I probably need to mention is that, that, you know, when it comes to the Okanagan, you've got a region where at the top end, the north, you're growing things like Pinot Gris and Riesling and Pinot Noir, with a very cool climate. And, and you, you stay in the same region and travel 100 kilometers down the lake. And you're in the South Okanagan, where you can ripen Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Syrah. And there, I think you need to, they're, they're in, initiating these GIs, you know, these geographic indicators, you know, new regions. And there's a few of them have already been recognized. And I think that's helpful because there's just a, a world of difference between the North and the South. And we've got a wine from the South here, which is, well, two of them, in fact, we've got two Syrahs, the Vieux Pain and Burrowing Owl. And I'm very interested to know what you think of those because they're quite stylistically different. I think for me, for my palate, Vieux Pain is like just the, the, the best, absolutely the best. It's kind of precise, it's a bit peppery, it's Northern Ronin, Ronin style, but with, a, with an open argan twist. And Burrowing Owl is a, a very successful wine, but it's, it's made in a, a riper, softer sort of style. But I'd be curious to know what you think of those, if anyone's got any comments. Um, I have to pick on someone then. Ben, did, what do you think? I think Sarah has a has a future. I, I was quite interested by these. I found them. Uh, they both had quite meaty, gamey uh, aromas and and um, flavours, and the pepperiness was a real core element of both wines. Um, I think there could be some really exciting potential in restaurants. I, I have a quite a few state restaurants we supply in the southwest who love that kind of really gamey, meaty Syrah. Um, and we usually provide it from quite an unusual Central and Eastern European destination. So I think Canada to most people is, is a bit more familiar than that. Um, so I think in an on-trade setting, uh, they could be really interesting wines. For me, they, they didn't quite have the fruit to get the, the consumer excited who might be having it just by the glass. Um, but I think with food, it could be, could be really interesting, definitely. David, are you a fan of um, Canadian um, Syrah? Um, yeah, I, I like I like the I'm like you. Yeah, I like the Vieux Pain. I think it's a really really smart wine, um, and I think I just think that they're further ahead. You know, generally the standard of Pinots is further ahead stylistically um, than than Syrah at the moment. Um, and I, I, it comes back to what I was saying. I think there's um, you know there's been huge progress in the past decade, um, and I think we're going to see that. Uh, that carry on. And it could be, you know, as you said, north to south in the Okanagan is, is close to 200 kilometers, you know, in distance. That's, so, you know, Margaret River is 125 kilometers. So, and, you know, look at the difference between Cabernet and, and Chardonnay from the north to south there. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done to find the right sites 
um, and, and, and probably the right, the right viticulture. Um, but it, it holds out real promise for me. Yeah. I think if, you know, I think the key is, and I'm probably not as, as big a fan of Cabernet Franc as, as you are. Um, and I think that's just personal and stylistic, but I think the key with the varieties here is to get something like Pinot, which is relatively early ripening. Um, so you're not, um, exposed, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, spring can be pretty, pretty cold, as we know, in, in Canada, and you're going to, you know, bud break's going to be late. So, you know, you want that, you, you don't want anything that's going to be too late ripening, would be my view. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, Pinot shows that here. I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's more successful at the moment. I think also the, the strength of Pinot, I think, is that people are used to paying a bit more for Pinot Noir. It's, yeah. it's rarely a cheap wine. So yeah. people have a different expectations. When they're buying Riesling, they don't want to spend it very much because you can get amazing Riesling from Germany for a tenner, um, you know. So, so when it comes to Pinot Noir, you know you're going to have to pay for it. So I think that that's why I find it quite encouraging to see such a strong lineup of Pinot Noirs. Although I did struggle a little bit with the, the Mission Hill, which normally is a really good wine. I found that, that it just had this strong green streak. This, and I don't know what yeah. that is because I've never had that before from them. But otherwise, I thought this is a really... I think the work with Pino has been fantastic because these these wines are, are, are just just clever yeah. wines. It, it is, and you touch on price, there, Jamie. Uh, we did have the, you know we were tasting these with the prices cited. I tried not to refer too much, but it was inescapable to me having spent a number of years um, trying, usually fairly successfully, to sell fairly premium Canadian Pinot. Actually, how attractive some of the prices were on these Pinot Noirs. And that maybe detracted a little bit from some of the other wines, which were well, I thought were good, but were maybe not as good as the the money that was being asked for them. Um, but consistently, the the Pinot Noirs that I liked were you know wines that are in the low twenties, which is for you know for good Pinot Noir anywhere in the world. If it can end up on a retail shelf in the UK at under twenty five pounds, you're doing something really really well. Uh, and that surprised me. I was I was completely shocked. Things like um, the one that's in Oddbins, uh, which one was that? The, the oh, Tours Winery. Um, I mean, I just thought it was a, a really charming, nice Pinot Noir at £21. You put that next to a Bourgogne Rouge and you're laughing at that kind of price. And, and that's what I think Canada has to try and focus on doing. It's it's not picking off at the lower end. I get a bit nervous when I hear about discounters doing things at 10 quid from Canada. Canada needs to be playing at that um, entry to the mid tier where it can actually really pick off the overpriced, slightly complacent um, mid tier wines from the old world, from the key regions of the old world, like, like a Bourgogne Rouge, for example. There's a question on the- gonna, yeah, Sorry, Jamie, you might've been there, gonna jump in with um, Adam's question. Hi, Adam, oh. out there, Adam Lechmere, about um, can, we, can we swing back to Shards for a moment, Chardonnay and- um, talk a little bit about the use of oak. What was the general sort of feeling with oak and perhaps overall with the Chardonnays? We, we did touch on them, but Adam was being specific about use of uh, use of oak. Sorry, did anyone want to pick up on that? Anyone? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, um, yeah. You know, I, I think, um, you know, what, what if you put this into sort of, you know, a, a perspective of what's happened over the last decade with these wines, the oak has um, been sort of pulled back a bit, I think. Um, and, but that's a global trend. Um, I still think with some of these wines, there's room to uh, go to either larger format oak, lower toast, or a bit more, a bit older oak, um, just to sort of, you know, reduce that, that sort of smoky bang that you get with a couple of the wines. But I think they're certainly moving, in, my, my view is they're moving in the right direction. Okay, yeah, I, I thought it was a, a bit of a, a flight of two halves when I tasted through the, the, the Chardonnays. Um, there were some beautiful wines there, I felt, but some that, that were um, perhaps over-egging it very slightly. But um, yeah. another, another question while we're on Canada, and we, we did mention earlier, forgive me, I can't remember who talked briefly about um, a couple of the, some of the sparkling wines. Um, Janet, sorry, it was yourself. You said we couldn't really bring them over, obviously, in our, our little sample bottles that we have, which is understandable. But um, anyone else on the panel um, had a lot of experience or any experience with sparkling wines uh, enough to carry away a sense of whether or not that is also uh, something that Canada, Canada could be putting itself forward to into sort of you know, key export markets? 
We've got a big thumbs up from, uh, from our friends in Canada. That's good to see you. At least there's confidence at that end. We, we, looked, um, we looked a couple of years ago at uh, some wines, some sparklers from Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, we're, we're impressed. Really like the wines. Um, but uh, just felt at the time that, you know, that the sparkling wine category here, we weren't brave enough to want to enter those with, um, uh, you know, with, with, with Nova Scotia sparklers at the time anyway. But I think there is potential. And I think, you know, what we're seeing in the UK market, you know, as, as I'm sure everyone would say, if you've been around long enough, you know, it used to be very difficult to sell other sparklers other than cheap wines. You know, the success of English sparklers has opened up the category to sparkling wines from around the world, and it's no longer just champagne. So I think there will be space in there um, one day. Yeah. yeah. Would be my yeah. view. And, and we, we, we've been importing a, a traditional method, vintage sparkling wine from Ockenheim Crush Pad for, for several years. And it is, it's an exceptional wine, but it's by far and away the hardest sell, yeah. I think, because there is competition in sparkling wine, which it's not there's no, there's no competition in the other wines. But if you're looking at restaurant wine lists um, and even, you know, a, war, a broader range you'd have on a shop shelf, it's a bit like your goalkeeper in a, in, in a soccer team. You, you know, you, you only need one. And you don't change him very often, um, or the wicketkeeper in the cricket team. And so you have your champagne, tick. Increasingly, you have your English sparkling wine, tick. You have your Prosecco, tick. You very quickly run out of space for esoteric options. You might have a Franciacorta, you might have something from Tasmania. And Canada is a long way down that list when you might only have space on your wine list for half a dozen sparkling wines. Uh, th and that's what we find, which is no reflection on the quality. It's just, I think, that people would rather see a Canadian Pinot Noir on their list than make space for a, a sparkling one at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that, that fully makes sense. And I think we've already touched on the fact that, that obviously sparklings from all over, uh, there aren't necessarily successful Pinot Noirs from, from, from all over the world. And also price there is, is a factor when you're competing against uh, the most traditional areas and, as with Burgundy at the moment. So I guess, I guess Pinot might be an easier easier selling, which I, I guess seems kind of quite neatly to asking you guys as importers and girls, forgive me, Sarah, um, as importers, what 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 actually sells best? What's strongest and kind of why from what you're, you're bringing over in your in your portfolios and ha had a look around and you're bringing in various things and some some quite exciting wines there. But, but what what resonates? Why and where in this market? Who would like to, to begin? Actually, Sarah, should we begin with you? What's what's what do you find? Um, so I guess the wine side has been selling Canadian wine for probably six or seven years now, so not very long. Um, and we've usually found the most successful, the most sort of um, the the easiest reception from members is for Pinot and Chardonnay. Um, we've shipped from both Okanagan and from Niagara, but um, but no, the when we're talking table wines, Pinot and Chardonnay seem to do the strongest. Uh, we had a lovely parcel of Riesling from from Little Farm, which was just excellent but it's a trickier trickier proposition um against the uk market and against its sort of category um but we we also find um the price point is tricky um because a lot of members may be keen to explore interesting wines and and i think um sort of independent retail and and online specialists is sort of a good place for canada um but they still like something um a little bit more um entry level so it's sort of 14 pounds or 10, 10 to 15, whereas having everything above 20 or trying very hard to get it down to 1995 um, is a, a sort of big investment for a, a try of something completely new to many of our members. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we tend to ship um, a different winery each year pretty much and are happy to, to sell interesting things at that price point. Um, but it's not going to, it's not driving huge volume at this point. Um, ice wine at Christmas um, is an easier spot. Um, although, again, all sweet wines, even at Christmas, are reasonably small volumes. Okay, well, thanks. That's, that's interesting with um, your voluntarily, I should point out, captive uh, audience. Um, not a bad place to be caught, I suppose, the Wine Society. Um, but, I mean, uh, anyone else want to pick up on that? I mean, Ben, what's, what's, what's your experience with what sells through, what works, what you can shift? 
So, I mean, we're, we're quite new to Canadian wine. Um, so some of my favorite Canadian wines, we, we sell our Rieslings. Um, the, the best feedback I've ever had on any of my wines, and, and that's testament to something, is, is the Haywire White Label Gamay Noir that Nick um, imports always punches well above its weight, even for the price point. And uh, yeah, it's st stunning Canadian wine that when we get it back, we're going to sell it like wildfire because it's it's uh, it's honestly one of the favorite wines on my list. Um, in, in conjunction with that, we started with Henry of Pelham and the Bacca Noir is, is something interesting. I mean, our customers are, are looking quite actively for esoteric wines because of the kind of wines we stock. So anything that's not a traditional grape variety is, is exciting for our customers. Um, so it'd be interesting if there's dry Vidal's and, and, and more Bacca Noirs and, and Gamay's and all those kind of uh, more exciting grape varieties are not uh, obviously Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are stunning, but if everyone under the sun in the UK has got Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So for, for us, it's, it's everything else that gets us excited. Um, having said that and having tasted the Chardonnays, I really want some Canadian Chardonnay on my list after, after tasting some of these samples because I think they're brilliant. And just to touch on the sparkling wine point, we sell a lot of sparkling wines from Slovenia, Switzerland and, and all the other places that, that people don't think of. Um, and I, I would be gun-ho for trying a uh, sparkling Canadian wine as well. But again, our, our customers are looking for things that other people don't have. So um, we will kind of be picking up the niche market as, as everyone else focuses on, on pushing the, the wildly popular stuff. So I, I think for, for me, um, the variety is, is the most exciting bit. And even Canada is, is more classical than some of our regions that we specialize in. So there's a safer and more trustworthy element for our consumers who are looking for something. So yeah, I'm excited to grow the Canadian range, definitely. Yeah, how does it work for our um, um, importers there? So obviously, Nick, we hear you're, you're selling some wine, I think, through um, through through Ben's. Yeah. That's obviously one outlet, but um, what's, but it, what's your take? Yeah. Consistently, Gamay and Pinot Noir, uh, and they sell well, but to very different, I think, channels um, or, or sorts of customers. And I would long-term, I would like to see the Gamay Get, in, get a nose ahead, not because the Pinot Noir isn't excellent and not because as this tasting of wines we've all had shows that Pinot Noir excels, whether it's Okanagan or Niagara or whether it's, it's a great variety for Canada. But Gamay does a lot of the things that Pinot does, you know, viticulturally, climate wise, it delivers, you know, similar flavors that people are looking for, similar styles, and it is distinctive. There's no country in the world outside of France and, and you know with its Beaujolais that has really got a feather in its cap for Gamay and that's something that we're probably talking more about Okanagan here and than necessarily Niagara but it's something I think that they could. Nick, 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 yeah. um, Gamay is huge in Niagara, it's yeah, bigger yeah. than Niagara than in the Okanagan, yeah. Okay, and there you go. Jado, Jado actually coined a hashtag which is Go Gamay Go. I know. Um, so, so Niagara is definitely Canada's, um, you know, the center of Canadian gamay production. There's a, there's some nice ones in the Okanagan, but there's quite a bit of it planted in um, in Niagara. Okay. Well, Hashtag coined in 2012 because I knew the promise. It was also the first grape uh, uh, when Inniskillen got a winery license in 1974 that they planted. So it's there's something about gamay in Ontario and Canada, right, Jamie? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, Malivoir I'm, I'm, t-shirt with Gamay on it. So Malivoir, one of the, the proponents of, um, of Gamay, and they've done a nice t-shirt. Yeah, I, I'd love to see um, Gamay being put on a bit more of a pedestal, perhaps, but perhaps just the, that's the wine geek in me talking rather than the realist. Um, but definitely Pinot and Gamay seem to do best for us. Uh, David, is this a law of sort of diminishing returns? Is there, is there something else you can add that's slightly different from the Liberty perspective uh, across? Um, the, just the... Um, you know, it, it, the different sort of um, channels that we sell in, I think that ice wine is, you know, sales of ice wine are about 75% into the independent off trade. Um, so, you know, there's a there's an established market there, whereas Chardonnay, which is our biggest seller of, of the still wines, is about 25%, about, well, sorry, one third um, 
independent off trade and two thirds on trade. So, um, and I think, you know, I think coming back to a point Nick touched on earlier on about price, um, you know, Canada is not going to be cheap. These wines aren't going to be cheap. Um, you know, I mean, Ontario, um, the latest stats I saw has, I think it's just over 7,000 hectares of vineyard. That's about the same size as Chianti Classico. You know, um, so there's, there's not a lot of, 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 of land there. There's not a lot of scale. So, you know, these wines are not going to be cheap. So they've got to be good. Um, and that's where they're going, they're going to compete with the best of the wines from you know the rest of the world and perhaps as nick says come in and 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 nick something from sort of you know sort of jaded um sort of producers whether in the old world or the new world with their bright vibrant fruit yeah no i don't know if anyone else wants to pick up on that jamie, jamie what thoughts yourself i mean I, I sense that for most majority of people in the uk canada is a, a blank slate um when it comes when it comes to wine, perhaps outside of ice wine, which we, we've already mentioned, um, what what are, what are your thoughts? What what would you do if um, you would join forces with Janet? Um, well, the first thing, the first that's terrifying thought, isn't it? The first thought is I think it's is a great to, thought. It's, <laughs> what, you're only selling wine. Goodness <laughs> me! I'm going to sell wine in the UK, you know, or globally. Yeah. No, I think what what I would what I would. Um, First, do is segment the market because the rules that apply to different segments are very different. And I think so, you know, nobody wants to play at the bottom end. You can't make money there properly, and it's messy. And and the, your your channels to market swallow up all your profitability, and it's crowded. And in a world of oversupply, it's just if you're a wine producer, you don't want to play there. Um, so then you're looking at other segments, and I think that I think that what you have to do is almost like if you're a producer, you've got to take a hit to get yourself established in export markets. Because when you've got a comfortable domestic market that will pay a certain price for your wines, and remember in BC, I think the law is about to change. You, you, there was no, there was no um, wholesale discount. You know, you, you could, it was illegal to sell the wine to a restaurant at less than the retail price of the wine. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of slightly arcane sort of problems with the structure of the Canadian wine industry that have, and there's a little bit of protection in them as well with this, this inability to, to, you know, as a journalist visiting Canada, I got to know Canadian wine better than most Canadian wine journalists because the ones in BC had no access to um, Ontario wine and the ones in Ontario had no access to BC wine because why would you send samples to somebody when you can't actually sell your wine in that province very easily, you know, so, so, the, so what I think I would do is I think I would, um, I'd say to producers, look, if you get serious about exporting, take a hit, you know, you know, you're know, you gonna probably be able to sell your wine for more money in the domestic market, but this is playing the long game. And playing the long game, it's choosing things that will get Canada through the door, which I think, think, think Pinot Noir and Chardonnay is a really good choice. I think going too esoteric too quickly or complicating the message is a, is a problem. And I think David's point is well taken that ice wine has got people you know, it's got Canada through the door. It's got people thinking that wine is made in Canada, and then the challenge comes is, is to is to broaden their um, their understanding and not expect. I think as well when you're dealing with normal people, not wine trade people, you can't assume too much knowledge. You really can't. And so the first is the first thing is to build brand equity in Canada, simply Canada. It's almost too much of a stretch to start talking about the different regions, even though they're so very different. So just to get people to taste a, a Canadian Chardonnay or a Canadian Riesling or a Canadian Pinot Noir, that's enough, you know, and if they're good quality products at, a, at the right sort of price, and Nick mentioned the Tours Pinot Noir in Aubins at £21, that's, that's fantastic. I think M&S made an error, what they brought a Southbrook um, Red into the UK and listed it, and it had like 10 grams of residual sugar, it tasted like a stuck ferment um, that was being sold off in bulk. It was, it was really not a nice wine. And I think that's a big danger is that you can't just buy something because it's cheap and then try and sell it in the UK. Even if there's someone who'll buy it, it's like your first impressions matter so significantly when it comes to an unknown country. And um, the first impressions, the first encounter that people have with Canadian wine, I think for most people in the UK, then when they taste a Canadian wine, it will be their first encounter. And I think it's so vital that that is a good experience. So I think if I was with Janet and we were sitting down talking about strategy, it would be like trying to get get producers who can make something that's smart at an affordable price, 
that is a good example of what Canada does and encouraging them to, to hit the market. Maybe a, a group of producers getting together, you know, because it's, it's, it's almost like you need to make some sort of sacrifice and profitability to start off with in order to get the ball rolling. Can I add something to that, Jimmy? I, 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 I think the important thing rather than affordable price is, is, is top quality. You know, as, as Andrew said, uh, you know, when we were kicking off, we've certainly seen an increase in average selling price over the past 12 months, um, you know, during lockdown. Um, and we're expecting to see it when restaurants open up again. Um, and I think that, you know, Canada has to establish itself as a, as a, as a quality wine producing country. Um, and that will only be done if the producers sort of, you know, do you know, everything they can to make the best possible wine. Yields are never going to be high enough there to, uh, to get cost of goods down. So, you know, whether it's, I mean, I, I agree. I think that, you know, that, that, that um, the growers Pinot is, is, is very good and it's great value. Um, but, you know, moving up, focus on, on, you know, it doesn't really matter, 30, 50 quid a bottle. If it's good, it'll, it'll compete. And, and I, I agree with you. Canada needs to open up a bit to the outside world, you know, for the, the non-Canadians on, on this call, uh, 1972 might not be an important year, but that was the year when, when Russia and Canada had a, had a hockey series. And we'd been saying for years, oh, Canada, you know, we're the best in the world. We just can't send our best players to the world championships. So Russia won. And, you know, we started playing and, you know, it went down to the eighth game in the series with 34 seconds left before Canada won. That's what divided the two countries. And that, open Canada's eyes up to the fact that it needed to improve what it was doing in hockey as well. Getting into the outside world, mixing and competing is going to do the same thing with wines and it'll make the wines get better and better. I and the other thing, yes, David. One other, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Jamie. Um, I was going to agree with you, David. I think quality is key. Well, what about um, the hockey? <laughs> Always so, so on the hockey. film in there, David. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But quality, quality is is the key for these wines. I think it, it's a huge mistake to have a to bring in a Canadian wine that doesn't over deliver. Yeah. Um, but there is, all, I think, critical price points can't be ignored. So at twenty pounds currently on the wine society's list, for an example, we have Tours Chardonnay, um, but below it is Kumu Estate Chardonnay. Below it are some fantastic Chablis. Um, you know, just just around that price point is really competitive and, and tricky. And I think a um, consumer in the UK is in a fantastic position that if they want to spend 20 to 25 pounds on a bottle of wine, then they can buy phenomenal Chardonnays from around the world there. And I think you made a very interesting point earlier about Chianti Classico's size and potentially comparing that to some of the regions for, for, Calif for Canada. Um, but you can also buy fantastic Chianti Classico under twenty pounds, as you and I Absolutely. both know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so there, are, you know, size isn't the isn't the sort of constraint here. And we can go into costs of production, and perhaps Chianti Classico has had many many more years to pay off some of those, you know, entry to costs of vineyard uh, management and, and estate building. But um, but if Canada wants to compete in a in a truly you know complex and crowded international wine market. Um, then they have to put their best wines at really good price points. Um, anyone can make great wine at fifty pounds. We just, you know, can't necessarily sell it. Tell the Burgundians that. <laughs> uh, anyone can buy wine at fifty pounds. Sure. Exactly. Some some exactly. people can buy one, but but without considering the. Uh, yeah, so Canada is going to remain, I think, necessarily niche, but not in not in a bad way, and because of that, yeah. and drive. It has to strive not just for the top, but to be exceedingly good in perhaps the, the, the mid ground. Can we call 20 quid the mid ground? I think it's fair enough, isn't it? Well, it, it has to prove why people would go for Canada. So you can be esoteric once and you can get that buy once or twice from somebody buying um, something interesting because it's interesting sake. But there's always another interesting and esoteric wine that might grab their spend next time. And Canada needs to build Canada. So Canadian Chardonnay, Canadian Pinot Noir. I think things like simple labeling changes could help that too. Um, you know, the, the AVAs, forgive me if they're not AVAs, are they? What, what, <laughs> but the, yeah. the various sub-regional identities. VQAs. VQAs. Um, VQAs in Ontario and, and GIs in British Columbia. And they're all unknown in the UK. <laughs> and they confuse matters. Um, Canadian Chardonnay, potentially with Ontario or British Columbia, 
would help more. Niagara is a good advantage because it's a tourist site. Um, so at least, you know, people around the world understand where Niagara is. But, you know, simple labeling, developing a core brand, getting really good quality wines onto the market. And I think we can call 20 pounds mid price or mid market here when we're talking about fine wine. But we have to remember that that's nowhere near mid market for the wine trade. You know, the UK average is still around five or six pounds a bottle. The wine society is selling to members of the country of the UK who decided that they, they are interested in wine and have joined a club and paid a subscription to join us initially. And our average price is just you know around 10 pounds. So these wines are, are mid for a fine wine price point coming in at 20. And there are relatively few Canadian wines at 20 pounds that over deliver. And they're the ones that I have to keep trying to find. And there are some, and they're, they're wonderful. And we have some in this range today, um, but that's, that's the challenge. Okay, you, you don't have volume constraints particularly, do you, Sarah, one way or another? You, you're, you're, you can be quite flexible as the wine society. I mean, it's part of the whole point, surely. You can take on sort of smaller parcels and, and yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we so. ship 10 cases to 10,000. Nick, were you going to, um, did you want to jump in there? I thought you... I, I just wanted to, to add really beyond the wines, uh, and this is something I said last time I was in Vancouver and uh, speaking at an event, Brand Canada has a lot going for it. And for us, that's the first introduction into you know, Forget the wines. People then taste the wines and they like them. And they might like them enough to buy them. But they get interested by the fact it's Canada. And there's a lot of goodwill towards Canada in this country for, for any number of reasons, which makes people more likely to take that leap of faith than they would if it was something um, unknown from Eastern Europe. Perhaps, I, I mean, Ben can maybe say whether that's true or not, because he does a lot of Eastern European wines. But from my perspective, Canada has, it, it's not as threatening to the consumer of, oh my God, what is, it, what is that going to taste like? Because, you know, we all love Canadians. We all love Canada. And that goes down well with a lot of people. Yeah, I, I would agree that Canada has this trust uh, currency even before you, you've, you've got to the wine um, in, in the same way that the classic regions do, but um, Canada for a slightly different reasons because it's touristic and, and people have an emotional attachment to it. So they're, they're more likely to give that first time esoteric purchase a go. And if the quality is there, they'll come back. So I, I think there's less hand selling involved than some of our other Eastern European wines that compete, you know, at, at often lower prices, but sometimes at the same price as well. So yeah, variety, definitely. So we're saying, uh, Ben, there's already that sort of very positive image of this sort of big and healthy and rugged country with proper weather summers and proper winters and skiing and various things like this and obviously sort of beautiful two sides to it to the coast I'm not quite sure people have an image of the middle apart from endless forest that's probably entirely inaccurate but anyway but um, totally inaccurate totally inaccurate mm. yeah yeah but it's, it's, it's that emotion you've told part of the story already because people are familiar with Canada so there, there's that emotional um even if they'd never been there's that fantasy of, of comfort and holiday and adventure and all that sort of thing so it's immediately exciting and attractive about having to, to sell the wine too much um, but th then if you can follow through with a good quality wine and a story as well uh, it makes for quite a wholesome experience and good thing about the UK is as people have said is, is people are looking um, for, for something and, and for that experience pleasure uh, more so than Okay, most wine is still a commodity trade, but there, there's plenty of wine lovers in the UK who want something more than that. Um, and Canada can can be one of the players who fulfills that, I think. I, I think that if you look at the, the New World Anglosphere, um, so whether it's South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, where there's also, I mean, for the most part, goodwill towards the wines from those countries, Canada hasn't gone through that down market phase that maybe Australian wine had and which for some UK consumers makes it difficult to trade them up to the exceptional quality you get 20 pounds plus from Australia. Um, it doesn't have the, I suppose, monotonous 
feel sometimes that New Zealand wine can have. Uh, and it doesn't have wines in the supermarket at five pounds a bottle like you do from South Africa, which again can sometimes make it hard to trade people up to what you're getting at 20 pounds plus. So it has a real opportunity to bypass all of that and maintain an aspirational feel to brand Canada and, and the wines from Canada. And, and that doesn't have to be really expensive. It can be like that towards Pinot. 20 pounds on the shelf at Oddbins, um, which is one of the less expensive wines in this lineup. But that I think maintains their position as something that is aspirational rather than falling into that trap of trying to be something to everyone. And just to, just, just to add to that, thanks Nick. Um, we've, um, Robert, Rob Arthur's just asked a question. I don't know, we're also aware of time out there uh, audience. So there are a lot of you out there. So. Do, do fire in um, any any questions that you wish. There's, I know there's been an awful lot of chat, which is really, really encouraging to see, but um, um, the question is, should Canada be Canada wines or by region, you know, for example, Niagara, et cetera, et cetera? Um, we, we kind of touched on that, but is, is it just way too early to start breaking it down? Because I mean, again, you're talking about a vast, vast country with, with, with very, very different sort of, you know, climates and distances and, and, and the rest of it. I mean, it's like, it's like calling a wine Australian, isn't it? Um, well, there has been that discussion over the years of Australia as well, you know, that Eden Valley, you know, Adelaide Hills, McLaren Vale, Margaret River, that's just frippery, really, and, and we shouldn't be dealing with that because the consumer doesn't want that. Um, it, you know, I, I really think that, yes, Canada is going to be the umbrella brand, as it were, but, you know, it's a big country. You know, we've got to, see, and the wines, you know, as, as, the, the sort of um, you know, winemaking develops there as we see more diversity coming into the styles being produced. I think that's going to accentuate regional differences. And I think that you know, what personally, my, you know, what we're seeing is that people who are spending you know, over 20 quid on a bottle of wine are looking for you know, wines from with particular provenance. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I think that's you know, as confusing as it may be, and I accept Sarah's point that people don't know, you know, where the Okanagan is, that, you know, they might know where Niagara is, but they don't know where 20 mile bench is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I think that's going to be part of our job to, to, to educate them. And I think it's going to be, you know, as that market develops, that's the, that's the target market for these wines is going to be people who are actually looking for wines of different provenance and are probably going to be open to learning about them as well. That would be my I, view anyway. I find that discussion, you know, in the wine trade, established members of the wine trade say, well, yes, it's all very well having these, you know, sub-regional differences, but the consumer won't make any sense of them. Yet in the next day, they'll be talking about the, the, the 936 climats in Bourgogne, you know, and it's the same issue with Burgundy, you know, you know, normal consumers are, are, are absolutely confused out of their heads. It's just as a wine trade, we're very familiar with that. So we think we allow Burgundy to have, you know, all its climats and its premier crews. I think there's 600 premier crews even, you know, um, but we don't allow Canada to start parceling out their vineyards into GIs or VQAs. And we say that it's, it's almost a, it's just because we're not familiar with Canada. If we were on the ground in Canada, then you, you, this all makes sense. And it's about segmenting the market. So some customers can handle this. Most customers can't handle it, even if it's in France. Although some of the major differences here is going to be length of time these wines have been in the UK market. And we often refer to Burgundy for those, you know, consumers in the UK that don't understand regionality or sub-regionality within Burgundy as Burgundy. You know, Claret takes, encompasses a huge number of different communes even within Bordeaux. So I think, you know, we, we have made um, signaling where wines are from simpler for consumers in the UK, even within the classic regions. And of course, I don't think I would ever argue to not suggest that there should be an understanding of sub-regionality. And I think that that can be at, you know, within Canada, I think winemakers need to know precisely the, you know, what their regions look like and taste like and where their vines should be best planted. And I think there perhaps should be some some changes there and, and learnings and understandings as the industry grows. But the length of time that Canada has been widely available in the UK, other than ice wine, um, I think we're, we're, you know, we could make it more um, consumer friendly quicker, whilst not losing 
the focus on subregionality and its importance on the styles of the wines. Yeah, I just think this is a market segmentation issue for most customers. You know, um, whatever region you're dealing with, too many geographical indicators are, are going to be confusing. They're, wine is an inherently very confusing. It does need to be simplified at certain segments. But um, once you pass those segments, I think David's point is quite good that the people who are buying these wines are the sort of people who, who are going to expect to find, you know, these, the, these complicated details like regions on the label. Which and I think, I think, sorry, 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 you know, you're going to have, you will have a bit of a pyramid, you know, you will have, you know, at the base, you'll have Canada, then you'll have Niagara, Okanagan, sort of, you know, uh, you know, wherever else, Vancouver Island, um, you know, Nova Scotia, and then above that, you might have the sub region or the vineyard, um, you know, which, again, is, a, is, a, is at least an architecture that we can, we can, we, we can understand within the trade, and I think a lot of consumers, it depends where they stop with that architecture, some will stop at Canada, Others will stop at Okanagan. Others will want to get stuck in to find out whether it's, you know, um, in a soil or is it north of Kelowna or whatever. You know? But reasonably too, that would need retailers to have a range of these available at once. So somebody like the Wine Society, for instance, where I have quite a um, an interesting way of selling some of these wines to members who are quite engaged. Even I find it difficult to justify more than two or three listings of Canadian wines oh. at a time. And I have to sell them on a cyclical basis because they're not the fastest moving within my categories or within my, my portfolio. And so they're not quite covering it. Perhaps, Ben, you might be able to list larger a number of Canadian wines to show that picture more easily. Um, but it's, it's hard for a consumer to learn the differences between the sub-regions if they're not able to buy multiple bottles across those sub-regions. Yeah. Um, where they can within some of the more traditional classic fine wine regions that we have in the UK, because they've been here for longer. So I think there's, there's an expectation as a purist and a wine trade geek, absolutely, let's go to the vine, let's define every vineyard, let's have them named, let's understand the, you know, the impact that, that has, but let's, let's not, you know, forget that there's some work to be done first. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. Um, but also, I think, you know, i sort of um I'm, I'm quite a bit older than you um obviously and you know i can remember when it used to be 35 years ago when i started importing italian wine when people would say oh one can to classico is all i want sorry that's fine no, more than enough so you know there will be you're right to start with it will be like that as you say and i think you know as start as the diversity from of canadian wine becomes more evident i think then you know we will start to see a greater argument for more breadth of choice. And that breadth of choice can only come if there's interest from consumer. So I don't know whether it's push or pull, but that'll it's a gradual organic development of, of, of what will happen. Um, you know, if and when Canada sort of you know evolves and puts itself on the international stage. So I mean, of think course, I, I Sorry, wonder Sarah. what the I wonder what the price point of the Chianti Classico was when it first entered the UK market. Was it pitching at 20 to 30 pounds as an entry, or was it a little bit more easy for a consumer to jump on, try many and expand the range? Uh, it was, um, yeah, yeah. Isla Olena was, um, was about uh, uh, 4.99, yeah. Um, so we have a different market now, and I think yeah. we're comparing apples and pears, and yeah. it's quite tricky to sort of roll back history and say that if, you know, in 50 years time, this'll, this'll be Canada, you know, we'll have, I'll be listing 25 different Canadian Chardonnays from all the different regions. Um, it'll only just be a bit smaller than, you know, Burgundy, but it's, you know, perhaps we, perhaps we need to um, compare like for like. I, think I the wonder market... if it's easier to compare more to Oregon as a region that is also pitching in a fine wine point that separates itself from American wine or Californian wine. It didn't have that entry level price point, which, you know, Canada, uh, Canada also doesn't have. It's working with not dissimilar grape varieties. So there's, there are other regions that are, are coming, becoming more prevalent and are perhaps 10, 15 years ahead of the, the place where Canada is at the moment. I'd thought about the Oregon sort of comparison, if you like, earlier, actually, and that, 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 you see, that sort of resonates for me as a consumer and someone that also writes about, writes about the trade in wine. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, Janet, how you feel about that with those 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 rivals across the border? But um, I think I think 
you know, you're getting yourself into a sort of niche position. I mean, there's still a degree of being, the trade being sold to. I mean, it occurs to me sitting here that we we have assembled, there is a, a panel of, you know, wonderful people from around the trade, uh, and communicator Jamie as well. Um, but you are all in essence converts. Um, you've, you know, you've, you've You've, you've paid your dollar as well. You've actually have these wines on your list. You're going out there judging, you're talking about them. So it would be interesting to have one or two people um, who aren't listing any Canadian wines to say kind of, you know, what's holding you back? Why aren't you doing this? What would help you to, what, you know, what would overcome that? Um, you know, it could simply come down to, you know, Ben, if you're specializing, well, that's fantastic because you have that, that sort of bandwidth to kind of line up a whole, a whole load of, you know, Chardonnays and Pinots and Gamays perhaps and so on. So you can achieve a kind of critical mass where you can talk about the differences. Whereas obviously, as was pointed out earlier, if you've, you know, you've only got so much space for, you're going to stick six Chardonnays or six Pinot Noirs on your list. Where does where does Canada come in that list, and what else are you knocking off? You know, to, to to get to squeeze Canada on in terms of expectation for your for your customers. You know, and even then, you're not going to achieve the kind of the breadth to be able to call it, for want of a better word, a category, are you? So consumers can come in and explore. They're just facing one, say, Canadian Riesling that you happen to like, which you've tacked onto your Riesling selection. So, so as you said before, it's it's, it's there's a bit of a catch twenty two going on until you begin to achieve a critical mass. No one's going to recognise you as well, and it's it's. Um, I suppose I could go around and down the plug hole on that particular thought, but it's it's kind of what we're here to talk about. Um, I think I, I don't know, um, Jamie. What do you think? If there's any anything extra to be said, um, we've had some nice nice chat and a couple of questions coming in, but I'm wondering if, by way of sort of summing up, we could what would be useful to uh, to kind of elicit a sort of final words from 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 all of the panelists. I think we've covered some really good ground. I, I think we really have um, explored the pertinent issues in good depth. And I think it's a, it's a kind of watch this space situation, isn't it, really? It's like, let's see more wines from Canada entering the UK market and see how they do. And I think there's, you know, as from, from what I've heard in this discussion, it does seem like there are, there are routes to market. And of course, there are, we haven't really mentioned it, but there are kind of niche routes as well, like natural wine and everything. There's a few natural producers in Canada. And they tend to find their own way um, by virtue of their niche. Um, but aside from that, I think, um, no, it's, it's really, um, I think it's a really, the vibe is generally a positive one, not ignoring some of the, the actual difficulties with, um, you know, selling any wines in a crowded market. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the impression I've come away with. Yeah, does anyone else want to um, add any final words to that? Uh, I, I would just, uh, there's one little question came through from, from Gerald about organic wines. I don't have data on it about how much organic wine Canada does, but it, it does do a lot. The ones that we do from Canada are organic. And we think of Canada as this wintry place where you go skiing and drink a lot of ice wine, but it has surprisingly large swathes of vineyard area, which are very arid, dry, sunny, hot areas, which are very conducive to organic viticulture. And so there's, there's plenty of it. And I think it ties into the other big, plus point that Canada has on the global stage, which it, it is seen, I, I don't know if this is accurate or fair or not, but it is seen as quite a green country, um, focusing on sustainability and, and that can tie into the sort of wines that they're producing and how they project that on the global stage as well. Actually, yeah, thanks for picking up that, that, that question as well. It just, just caught my eye a little late in the day there, but it's, it's um, I think it's really, uh, that is of growing importance to uh, customers, consumers, and their purchasing decisions. It's still a little way down the pecking line, but it seems to be rising up. People tend to say one thing about their um, uh, sustainable outlook on life, and, and perhaps not always, you know, follow that up. But it's definitely, um, definitely um, increasing in importance. So, um, Ben, any any final words from you on it? I was just just going to pick up finally on um, someone referenced Greek wine and and how that's that's kind of grown and and using it as as a comparison to Canadian wine. Uh, that the way we sell Greek wine and have it listed in in restaurants and and get consumers buying it is is always great variety led. And I think we we talked about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and actually a lot of the the way we push haywire uh, that Nick imports was through the fact that it was Gamay and it was offering an alternative to Burgundy, but also had something different that wasn't Pinot Noir. So I, I think 
grape varieties is not something to be forgotten about. People still have their hesitations over whether they should buy Chardonnay and whether or not they like Chardonnay. So that's always an interesting discussion. Um, and, and Pinot Noir, as, as we said, carries the price point. But I think with, with Greek wine, it was always about saying this is similar to, but offers you X, Y, Z that's different and interesting and always talking about the way the wine would fit in context, what it tastes like and what the variety was and the history and provenance of the grape rather than necessarily about the terroir and the landscape it came from. Um, that's a conversation we have later and something that people who are particularly passionate about wine uh, inquire about and find out about. So I think it's, it's, it's worth kind of exploring that and you know, if Canada is entering the market on its quality of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, can we offer it as a legitimate alternative to Burgundy as a interesting quality uh, wine country doing something that Burgundy is doing that's different, but also more price accessible? So I, I think if, if we don't forget that people are still buying based on grape, I think that it will make the conversation easier. Um, for selling and introducing more interesting Canadian wines. So that's that's something I would say. Yeah, no, fantastic. Um, Sarah, David, any 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 other comments? Probably gets more and more difficult if we're, we're summing up and you're further down around the, the, the list, yeah. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think it would just be to say how, how positive it actually is. I think it's, it's easy to get quite um, bogged down in, in sort of looking at price points, and I, I definitely have mention those but I think it's um I think the standard of wine is very good as long as that stays and you know very high and potentially gets even better these wines are going to be talked about and they're going to be picked up by buyers and we're going to try and present them to to our you know our customers um and I think that's the the great opportunity that Canada has I think going back to the ice wine story it may not be the one that Canada wants to continue um pushing but it puts you at a fine wine place with great um, just excitement and love of that style of wine and those qualities of wine and already spending good money. And everything that I think Nick and Ben picked up on too, with kind of his reputation more generally in the UK, really does sing to these wines um, being able to parachute in at that higher price point, as long as the quality remains really exciting. And I think with some of the wines we've seen on this tasting, you know, that rings true. There are exciting, high-quality wines from Canada. Um, it's a sort of working out how what success is. You know, what is it? Is it having um, lots and lots of wines listed and, and selling huge numbers of wines from different uh, sub-regions, or or is it getting a really great reputation for Canada going at this price point and as an alternative? Um, I think it's an exciting, very positive story at the moment. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Sarah. I, I was really um, impressed with um, with these wines. You know, the the, the overall standard, um, and yeah, there's a variation in style. Um, some people want you know use more oak. Some people use less. Um, but you know, you look at the Pinots, and I think in a way we've been sort of talking about Burgundy. But I think if we talk about sort of Austria and Germany, I think you know you, you're probably more stylistically where where those wines are with that sort of aromatic character and you know I, I i always remember years and years ago going to visit um the late david lake um he worked in washington state and you know he'd been out there for a number of years having started his life in the uk trade and and he said to, you know i asked him about oak, the okanagan at the time he said the okanagan could be the the rheingau of the pacific northwest now this was 30 plus years ago um you know but you see that with some of the aromatics coming across in these wines and i think um you know we should uh, um we should remember that so i think it's yeah but that's okanagan you know what you're going to get out of niagara may, may be a bit different um but i think it, it's promising and i think you know it's, it's quality 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 that's where um the future is going to be for these wines i think it's a pretty clear message um so janet you're <laughs> Nodding your head, um, J Doe, I should say. Um, so, any 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 thoughts on everything that you've heard um, from our, our well, all, all British, partial partial Canadian British um, uh, uh, panel there today? 
Yeah, well, it's been very interesting to hear some of these things reiterated because we have, I've heard them, our producers have heard them. As you know, we've been having an almost annual tasting at Canada House every year since uh, 2010, which started as a, a cool climate Chardonnay tasting only for Ontario and then has morphed to include all of Canada. Um, and just for those on the panel and, and listening, I mean, you know, when we started doing our tastings in 2010, there were two or three Canadian wineries in the market. We now have over 20 Canadian wineries in the market, which is why we were able to send out tasting packs with 16 wines. So there has been some growth and movement and, um, I, I think it's just, you know, we listen to what you're saying. Producers need to listen to what you're saying as well. Um, you know, we're happy to facilitate and, and partner with Harper's on things like this. And um, our regional associations have been bringing over trade and media to Canada for the past decade or so, which I think has been really helpful in raising awareness uh, of Canadian wine uh, in the marketplace. So, um, you know, it's an important market for us. The UK is the shop window to the world. Everyone wants to be here. You can get everything here and people will sell it at whatever price point the trade um, is asking for, right? So um, I think that's kind of been a, a, a learning lesson, a lesson to learn for some of our wineries coming into the market. And there's still a bit of work to do, but um, I'm still relatively young, so we have time. <laughs> Excellent. Now, I know there's no question. I think there's there's you know interest continues to grow here, and it's it's um I guess if you're coming from a very small base, it can feel like a slow process. But I, I just think without question, and um, just judging by the attendance we've had today, and the you know the the chat and so on, we've just actually had a um, Heather McRae asking along with maybe one or two others how they would get in touch with you, Janet, and the regional growing associations. What we can very easily do is, um, is ping out details, contact details um, to all who attended after the session, if that suits, suits all. So uh, we, can, we can follow up that way. But, um, and it's been, um, it was a, a real highlight actually of tasting so far this year, going through the, uh, really look forward to it and the flight didn't let down. So um, it was, it was um, yeah, really good. I've got, got a fair amount of samples left actually, so I can go back to a few this evening after a day of webinars. But, um, so um, it's, it's, it's been great. And as Jamie said, we've covered a lot of sort of um, salient and pertinent points. Um, uh, thank you all very, very much for your time and joining us and, and absolutely not least um, audience for tuning in. I hope it's been interesting for you. And as soon as we can um, get back to physical tastings, you'll be able to once again have the opportunity to go and taste Canada, um, you know, sort of um, in situ. Um, so uh, otherwise, it's a, it's, a, it's a thank you very much for me. And Janet, thank you very much for... Um, coming to Harper's and, and making all this happen as well. And Jamie, cheers, always, always great to uh, hear your words of wisdom too, never else. So thanks, Sarah, thanks, thanks. David, thanks, Nick. Thanks, thanks everyone. Ben. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye.